Sharbhai, just after 10 seconds, you can start to your talk. Just after 10 seconds, you can start. Ask you what name? Sorry, it's late. alaikum and good evening, respected physicians. Welcome you all in today's webinar on ECG Basic and Beyond organized by ECG study group. Today, we have 35th lecture on ECG in, ECG in clinical practice. Uh, and our today's speaker is Professor Khaled Mohsen, sir. We have two parts in this lecture session. The first part, Dr. Khaled Mohsen, Professor Khaled Mohsen, sir, will give a lecture on ECG in clinical practice and the second part, Professor Dr. Chaudhary Hafiz Hassan, Dr. Christoph Sisu, and Dr. Omar from USA will provide lectures. So before starting the session, I request Professor M. Atharali sir to introduce Professor Khaled Mohsen sir to us. Atharali sir. Sir, unmute yourself. Atta, sir, please unmute. Hello, thank you, Dr. Tushar. Very good evening to all the participants from the panelists and participants from the Bangladesh. And good morning to all the panelists from USA. Particularly, I am very much glad to welcome Dr. Christoph Soshu and Dr. Omor from USA as a panelist in our today's session. Sir, today's speaker is Dr. Khaled Mohsin. Khaled Mohsin does not need any introduction in Bangladeshi, actually, the Bangladeshi participants. Dr. Khaled Mohsin is a great teacher, always loved to teach. He is very much academic, methodical, leading interventional cardiologist. He is teacher, he is, he is actually my teacher, and I think he is teacher of our, many of our uh, established cardiologists right now. He is Dr. Khaled Mohsin. He has recently joined as a professor of cardiology in Universal Medical College. And as per suggestion of our Dr. Rofi Ahmed sir, we have introduced our, as a special category, that is the, some medical colleges and their cardiology department will lead the, this session. So today, uh, this is the first session as a medical college. Professor Khaled Mohsin will represent Universal Medical College as a today's patient. And uh, Professor uh, Khandukar Kamrul Islam will be with him, Professor Khaled Mohsin. And Universal Medical College, sir, this is a new medical college, one of the leading new medical college in Dhaka. And it is a private medical college, and it is one of the leading medical college. This medical college has got the established cardiology department, and Professor Khaled Mohsin is leading that department. And finally, I also like to welcome our Rubi Ghamed sir, international faculties from the USA, and Dr. Sudhri Habizul Hassan, and many of our faculties in today's session, Professor Mohsin Hussain, Professor Chandun Kumar Shah, Professor Rohit Sundin Mandal from Rashai, and Khandukar Asaduzan from uh, Asgur Ali Hospital, A.M. Shofik from United Hospital, and Abdul Al Jamil from the Asgur Ali Hospital. So this is very much good evening, and this is a nice, uh, uh, evening, I think, sir, this will be a great session. So, Professor Khaled Mohsin, I'd like to request you to present your case. And in the second half, so the Hafizul Hassan and his team, Christoph Shoshu and Dr. Omar Farooq will present their cases. So, at first of all, Professor Khaled Mohsin. Thank you, Professor Atar Ali, for your kind and elaborate in uh, introduction. Actually, you are too much gracious about choosing adjectives about me. Uh, so, I think. Uh, I don't deserve all those accolades, actually. So uh, respected panelists from home and abroad, a learned audience. Actually, uh, this is a, a rather hastily 
a arranged uh, topic i think i would have loved to have some time, more time to prepare myself but atarali bhai didn't allow me and he, he uh, almost uh, uh, imposed on me to present today but i am uh, grateful to him for giving me an opportunity uh, so um, let me share my screen Uh, can you can you see my screen, everybody? Yes, it is seen. Yeah. Yes, okay. You can see. Okay. Uh, actually, the uh, topic of my presentation is the interplay of heart and the device. Actually, heart is a very efficient and tireless organ of the body. Even when we are at sleep, the brain gets some rest, but the heart is it started beating in the mother's womb in the end of first trimester and it goes on and on unabated and uninterrupted until death but sometimes there is the loss of symphony of beats due to some uh, disease process and at that time we need to take the help of another very efficient device which is known as the pacemaker so we with a very uh, intricate interplay between the very two very very efficient organ and a very efficient uh, human made device though it is not perfect but it is uh, life saving and it uh, it uh, very uh, judiciously monitors our rhythm of the heart and interferes time to time and it is sometimes life threatening uh, whenever we see an ecg like this uh, we it is obviously it is not a pacemaker ecg but sometimes the pacemaker ecg resembles this type of ecg which we commonly know as the left bundle branch block and we need to check this type of ecgs when uh, we we must look for a pacemaker artifact which might come uh, before the p wave Uh, and before the QRS complex in in a very synchronous manner or sometimes in an asynchronous manner as well so whenever we see a white complex ecg we must keep in mind that it might be a pacemaker ecg as well and this is a, a common uh, pacemaker ecg uh, where we can see there is a electrical artifact which is uh, coming just in front of a qr white qrs complex and we and the p wave has got no uh, fixed relationship uh, with this uh, qrs complex or spike we obviously this is a, a vvi pacemaker uh, that means the single chamber pacemaker uh, it was very commonly used previously but its use has been uh, on a decline nowadays because the dual chamber pacemakers are being favored by the cardiologists because of the better hemodynamics and the co cost of the device is also uh, going down nowadays and it is becomes more affordable to the patients so everybody uh, nowadays we, we are preferring to implant a dual chamber pacemaker nowadays but this type of ecg is not uncommon in our practice but we have to keep in mind that the the bipolar pacemaker spike are sometimes very small and sometimes we tend to miss uh, the bipolar pacemaker spike when we are uh, reporting an ecg and sometimes we are reporting the ecg as just a simple left bundle branch block so as a cardiologist we need to uh, overcome this sort of omission uh, so that uh, our ecg report is not ridiculed by the other referring physicians so we have to keep this in mind uh, this is a, another uh, white complex ecg uh, uh, we uh, we are very much familiar with this and here we can see that the, there are uh, two spikes actually one in
uh, here there is there are two spikes one in front of the p wave and another in front of the qrs complex uh sorry i need to have the the this is the this is the uh, the spike before the p wave and another uh, this is the p wave the the atrial spike and the ventricular spike and this uh, synchronous behavior or synchronous uh, nature of the complexes are maintained and this is we are familiar with this type of speaking this is the av sequential spacing but we can uh, which is commonly described and here there is another uh, type of pacing there is a p wave there and after a fixed interval there is a, a qrs complex uh, which is preceded by an electrical uh, spike which is called the av synchronous pacing that the the p wave is sensed by the pacemaker but uh, and after a uh, fixed interval a qrs uh, uh there is as there is no natural qrs is coming the spike is given and followed by there is there is a ventricular capture in in this way the pacemaker uh, uh, maintains the av synchrony maintains the hemodynamics and thereby the conservation of the battery energy because the one spike less uh, is there so it is a is a battery conserving uh, measure but we have to be very uh sure that the patient has got a good uh, atrial activity which is it should be normal and not in uh, case of atrial fibrillation and uh, this uh, the p wave activity should be assessed and this type of pacemaker programming can be uh, introduced here uh, there is a uh, some additional uh, pacemaker spikes uh, it is some are falling on the p wave uh, some are uh, falling in the normal uh, location before the p wave before the qrs complex this is obviously uh, this is a, a sensing failure we come to uh, 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 them an analyze them in uh, more details in subsequent ecgs but if we find that this is random pacemaker artifacts in different locations of the ecg we might think that the pacemaker is unable to analyze the intrinsic rhythm of the heart and obviously this is a, a patient uh, on uh, on a pacemaker therapy uh, where there is a no uh, p wave the patient is in atrial fibrillation and in these cases the atrial pacing is uh, uh, atrial sensing is not Uh, beneficial or not uh, in the uh, it it is not going to improve the hemodynamics only in this group of patient the uh, the vvi uh, mode is the uh, preferred mode of pacing then we come to a, a pacemaker a, the the pacemaker in a patient implanted quite a long term ago in an elderly person the patient uh, has no regular follow up but the patient has presented with a, an irregular pulse so uh, uh, where we can see that the the pacemaker uh, these are obviously this is the the white qrs complex at the paced uh, uh, the rhythm which is preceded by a spike uh, but there is a uh, narrow qrs complex uh, after the paced rhythm and this represents uh, the uh, retrograde activation of the atrium uh, the ventricular atrial uh, conduction is intact particularly these are seen in cases of Uh, uh the sinus node disease where the va conduction is intact and this uh, this represents the retrograde activation and 
uh, we can, if we can meticulously see that there is an inverted P wave before this uh, naturally occurring QRS complex. And these are the, uh, 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 we can, uh, this uh, is by defined as the eco, eco bit, eco bit, and this uh, causes some uh, uh, symptomatic, uh, 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 the patient has got some bizarre symptoms and the hemodynamics also is compromised. I, I would like to have some comment on uh, uh, this type of VA conduction uh, by our experts, uh, Atarbhai. Can you make a comment or Rafik sir, please? <laughs> no. First of all, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Khalid Mohsin, whether the sensing and pacing function is okay of this pacemaker, what is your comment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the pacing, uh, there is a, actually the pacing function is a, uh, there is a P wave followed by a QRS complex. Uh, there, uh, the, the, the PR interval is definitely is very short. Uh, we can see that the, there should be a, a, the more gap between uh, the uh, P wave and the, uh, uh, I think there's a short PR interval and that is why the uh, retrograde activation is uh, occurring. So uh, would you please make a comment about it? So finally, we'll yes. take a comment from our Rupik sir, but before that, Dr. Christoph Shoshu, can you make a comment on this ECG, whether the pacemaker function is okay or not? Dr. Christoph Shoshu? So, um, as Dr. Uh, Mushan said, there is uh, a, okay. a, a normal QRS or a pace ribbon after the spike. So the pacemaker to me seems to be functioning except for the one, two, three, four, the fifth beat over here. If you go to the, the fifth beat, um, even though there is a, that QRS, it differs compared to the other space QRS. So I'm not hundred percent certain. It's a small QRS, the amplitude is small. Um, on the fifth beat, on the last strip, on the fifth beat. So, so uh, Atharvai, just to give you an idea that uh, our two participants, uh, uh, Chris Susu and Omar Altalowell, they are both certified in internal medicine. They are just started their cardiology fellowship. So they are not certified cardiologists yet. They are here to learn. So I would not put them on this spot. But I would okay. rather hear from the EP guys. So, Ropik, sir. Uh, can, I, can I add something other way? Okay, Jamil. Uh, uh, after the uh, fast pace and uh, retrograde normal QRS, there is uh, one P wave that is not sensed, followed, uh, or it might be artifact. I, I don't know exactly. But uh, it seems that in every QRS complex before uh, there is a P wave in most of the pace bits and followed by a, a narrow complex and that has also a P wave and in a different morphology. So I do agree with Khaled Mohsen, Dr. Khaled Mohsen that uh, it, these are the echo bits that are uh, transmitted retrogradely to the atrium and then again came back uh, to the ventricles. Dr. Jamil, what do you mean by the eco bit? These are the sense bit, I think. These are the supraventricular. Difficult to say, yeah. as because it's, uh, the, the, the reflected the, 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 the so the short. Strip, see, the narrow QRS complex are preceded by the inverted P waves. Yes. So these are the supraventricular ectopics, and these are nicely sensed. And the, the, the that time is exited. Why not that P wave is retrograde P wave of the previous space complex? That's a good. So we'll take final comments from the Rupik sir. Rupik sir. Yeah. Oh, this is an interesting ECG. First of all, Khalid Motion, thank you. Uh, I contradict one thing. Khalid Motion says heart is working nonstop. My father used to say that is not true. Because in 0.8 second, heart only works 0.3 second, as opposed to that brain is working even when we are sleeping. So heart actually is one of the laziest organs in the body. If we live 80 years, 
heart is working only 30 years. Anyway, that's the <laughs> philosophy. So I, I think this is what's happening. Let's start with the, with the third complex. The third complex, there is a P wave followed by a pacing spike QRS. So Rafik Bhai, since you brought up a very, Rafik Bhai, Rafik Bhai. Yes. Go ahead. Can, can you hear me? Since you yes. brought up a, uh, since you brought up a controversial subject, the diastole of heart is actually an active process, and it consumes <laughs> ATP. <laughs> <laughs> so just for the audience, for the record. <laughs> and and again, uh, what Rofixar said. During sleep, brain and uh, not at all take any rest. It goes on uh, ac activating yes. every. So go moment. on with your pacemaker. Every fraction of seconds. Okay. So I mean, if we look at the third beat, there is the P wave followed by Q wave. So this is actual cell ventricular phase beat. And then there is a P wave, which is about 600 milliseconds outside of the QRS complex. Yes, sir. Let's go to the third, fourth, fifth bit, actual cell ventricular paste, and then 600 milliseconds later, there is a P wave followed by a narrow QRS complex. I don't believe this is a retrograde. Why? For two reasons. One, if you look at the retrograde time to be that long is very unusual. It is possible, but unusual. Second, if we look at the P wave followed by the pacing spike, this pacing spike would retrogradely conceal because it is so short PR. So I think what's happening, this is the actual sense bit, uh, sensed ventricular pace followed by a spontaneous P wave, which is a different morphology, no, no question about it. Um, and then, and, and then there is a, a, another interesting part is if you go up on the top, the first beat, the P wave is positive followed by negative. If it is a retrograde, most of the time in V1, you will see a narrow positive complex. So that makes it, so why this rate is low? Um, the rate is close to 50, 45 to 50. One possibility is that this pacemaker is programmed to a backup rate of 45 bits, DDD 45, or the battery, I don't know what company device this is. If it is Medtronic, it would not behave like that even after many years. Once the battery goes down, it goes to a rate of 65. So that's my explanation. This is um, atrial sense ventricular pacing and then followed by P, uh, um, atrial beat, which is conducted down. Sir, can, sir, I, can I have a question? Yeah. Sir, the presence of narrow QRS. Yes. Always pacing uh, QRS, pace QRS. So yes. the QRS is too narrow or very narrow. So is it that uh, due to pacing, the retrograde conduction actually improves the conduction in the uh, ventricle, which results in that uh, that much narrowing? And, and no, I, I think this is a just a conducted QRS complex. So it will be narrow. Yes, sir. So it's a conducted sir, QRS complex. We also need to know what the programming was set at. So that will be interesting to know. Thank you. Sir, I think for, we should continue. Sir, for reporting, sir, for yes. reporting, what you will write? That is the, it is a paced rhythm, underlying complete heart block. With, um, so oh, what we will write? That is the reporting. Okay. That is the, if I am reporting it, I will write actual sensed ventricular pace and also. Um, actual bit which is conducted. This is not hard block because uh, every other bit is conducted. Yeah. And the bradycardia is due to sinus bradycardia. Okay, sir. So, sir, most likely it is uh, sinus, sinus node dysfunction. Yes, that, exactly. That uh, fires intermittently. Yep. And uh, uh, that's why this uh, slow rate is there. Yes, exactly. I agree with. Um, yeah, well, that's it. So this is why the last paste complex look different than the others? Be okay, uh, very nice question. Uh, it's, compared it's to the first, different, okay. different lead. No, 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 no. The the same lead. Oh, it's a different lead. Yes, different lead, sir. Oh, there's a lead change marker is there. Okay, it's not rhythm strip. Okay. All 
right. Anyway, let's let the speaker continue. It is not a rhythm script. It is no. not a rhythm script. No. Next slide, Khalid Mohsen, please. Yes, yes, perfect. Uh, this is another uh, patient, uh, an elderly lady on DDD pacing, complaints of shortness of breath and palpitation. Actually, uh, here we can see this is the atrial sensing ventricular pacing, but the pacing rate is uh, quite high, around 120 beats per minute. And the patient is unable to tolerate uh, this high rate of, uh, uh, and uh, there is a distinct P wave, uh, it is seen, and it is followed by a uh, QRS complex. So we uh, frequently encountered this sort of problems, particularly after, immediately after a pacemaker implantation, when there is a strong atrial activity and uh, possibly the upper tracking rate uh, is uh, uh, it's, uh, set a bit high, and this sort of uh, patients, particularly patients with ischemic heart disease, can have aggravated symptoms of ischemia, and some patients may go to heart failure as well. So, any any comment from our experts? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, sort of two things to be that is the two differential to be discussed from this ECG. Uh, one is, why it is not the pacemaker mediated tachycardia? And secondly, why it is not the atrial flutter? Yeah. These, th these two diagnoses should be excluded. Maybe uh, atrial tachycardia uh, also, Atavai. Possibly Abdul Wadu Chaudhuri. Atavai, it's maybe atrial tachycardia also. Yes, atrial tachycardia also. Abdul Wadu Chaudhuri? Sir, it's a mushkil uh, Look at the first lead one. You can see before each QR is complex, there is a spike, and before that, there is a P wave. So, PMT, the P wave should be behind the QR yeah. complex. Yes. After, so it's not PMT, pacemaker induced tachycardia. Now, do you know Flutter, if the heart rate were around 150, uh, I would have thought it's flutter. And one. Atrial tachycardia, yeah, that's a possibility. But uh, in that case, the ST segment should show some changes, which I cannot find out. So what is your diagnosis? That is a sinus tachycardia. I think it's sinus tachycardia. It's sinus tachycardia. But the rate is... And I think... 20, uh... That's why the heart rate is 120. In this case, the upper tracking rate, uh, can it be manipulated or is the, the sinus rate can be suppressed by some uh, agents like Evabradin can help the patients? Yes, that can be. But if it is the, but if the diagnosis is important, if it is a pacemaker mediated tachycardia, that can be controlled with the, some programming like the increasing the PVARP. So diagnosis is very much un, un, Unless we change the programming, it is difficult to control the pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So, Diagnosis is very important. According to Professor Chaudhuri, there is a P before the QRS complex in lead two. So this is against the pacemaker mediated tachycardia, but spike before QRS and the rate is nearly 130. These two are in favor of the pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So if there is no more comment, Rupik sir. Okay. Um, well, the rate is uh, 115. Uh, it's a cycle length of 520 millisecond. Um, it's about 115. So two possibilities. One, and all the possibilities are discussed. I doubt very much that this is PMT because PMT will happen at the programmed upper rate. Yeah. And it is very unlikely that we program upper rate at 115, usually 120, 130, 140. Yes. Those kind of numbers. Second, as Professor Odish Chaudhary mentioned, there is a P wave before each QRS complex. So. One possibility is that this is just sinus tachycardia or an atrial tachycardia being tracked. But please remember other possibility, also atrial flutter that Atahar mentioned. Because the rate, if it is two to one, because once the flutter rate will go above uh, the upper rate, it will become two to one. And that will fit into atrial flutter. The simple thing to do 
is to program this pacemaker to VVI to see what the underlying rhythm is. So if, I, if this patient was in my clinic, what I will do is that I'll reprogram the pacemaker temporarily for, to a rate of um, 50 to see what the underlying rhythm is. And of course, the treatment will be that if you are finding, it, treatment will be based on the etiology of the condition. I mean, if we it is sinus tachycardia, as Carl Mojin said, we can use beta blocker or we can use ifabradine if need be. Um, or if it is actual flat actual tachycardia to be treated appropriately. Thank you. Professor, can I move to another similar ECG, please? Please. Okay. Uh, this, this is another ECG, almost similar. Patient uh, having a DDD pacing for tachybrady syndrome, complaining of dizziness. This is a we, if we can compare with the previous ECG, the first part of the ECG, uh, there is uh, uh, the, uh, the P wave, it, it is not uh, uh, very uh, discernibly visible here, but the pacing spike is there. And the rate is even more, more than 130. And there is abrupt uh, change of the morphology of the ECG from following a uh, ectopic bit. And following the ectopic bit, we can see that uh, the nice AV sequential pacing. So this is a uh, example of pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Can, can I have your comment, please? In the first part, mediated, uh, in the first sir, part, these pacing spikes are falling on the T wave, right? Yeah. I think that's an artifact, and I said it's happening regularly. Yeah, it's it is, but um, I think I agree with colored motions. You know, if you look at the next one, also it looks like funny spike, but I think that's an artifact, and probably first part is a PMT, followed by um, a termination of PMT, followed by uh, a sequential phase rhythm. Sir, without any intervention whether the PMT can stop suddenly, spontaneously? Uh, yes, it can. If there is a retrograde block or what happens, let's say the retrograde conduction comes within the postventricular refractory period, then it will not sense it anymore. The third is a very remote possibility is that, which is very, very unlikely that uh, there is this narrow QRS conducted this pacing spike came down. This is very, very unlikely, unlikely. I mean, PMT can stop because of that, those two conditions. Retrograde block plus or retrograde X, uh, conduction becomes faster with um, P wave falling within the um, post-ventricular actual refractory period. Right, sir. Thank you, can you please comment on how to prevent a pacemaker mediated tachycardia by programming, appropriate programming of the pacemaker? The commonly uh, what we think the, the upper track. The reprogramming the PVARP, that is increasing the PVARP up to its, uh, that is a, sometimes the maximum limit up to the 450 millisecond, possibly, I think. Changing the mode and increasing the PVRP. These are the two modalities. Any more, for, uh, sir, Professor? But the way most of the time, the way PMT initiates, let's look at the first QRS complex after the PMT. Atrial paste, ventricular paste, right? So if, because there is atrial pacing, there is some integrate conduction in the AV node. That's why there is no retrograde conduction. However, if there is failure of atrial capture, the next ventricular paste complex will have a retrograde conduction. And that is the most of the time mechanism of initiation of PMT. Or sometimes it's a PVC which has a retrograde conduction. So first thing we have to make sure that the atrial threshold is good, number one. Number two, you can reprogram the post-ventricular atrial refractory period. What you do, you pace the ventricle 
in the uh, during programming and find out what is the rate to get conduction time is, which is doable in a dual chamber pacemaker. You can look at the time and please program it beyond that time. The problem is that when you prolong the post ventricular atrial refractory period, it's getting a little complex for general discussion. You lose the upper rate. So your upper rate then becomes lower. So that's the problem with that. But please remember, most of the time, reason for initiation of PMT is failure of atrial capture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir, can I can I move? Yes. To another issue, yes. please. Yes, I, yes, I have sorry. a logistic question, Ravik Bhai. In in US, we have an issue with the pacemaker. We have the pacemaker interrogation or device interrogation. Uh, Dr. Khaled Mosin, Khaled. Uh, what is the service you get in Bangladesh? Do you get any interrogation? Sometimes you know, we do interrogation ourselves, uh, particularly when there is an ICD issues. What services you have like in Bangladesh for the device interrogation? Actually, actually this is, uh, uh, is not uh, optimum actually. Uh, and most of the time, uh, apart from uh, the qualified electrophysiologist like uh, Atar Bhai, or Dr. Mohsin Hussain, or Dr. Abdullah Jamil, they used to call the service personnel to their uh, 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 consultation suit and they uh, direct them and they manipulate the parameters according uh, to the instruction of the uh, electrophysiologist. But in the most of the cases, the, the pacemaker uh, the company personnel, they do the programming. They do the because programming. Your, your first patient did not have any device check for a long time. A long so, time. Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted uh, to make sure that. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and this is another problem because uh, in some of the patients, they implant the pacemaker, then they go home and they don't return back for the the change of parameters at six weeks time or yearly follow-up. And some of them, uh, they are so reluctant, they come with end of life pacemaker uh, and uh, the pacemaker cannot be even interrogated at that point of time. So this is a real problem uh, regarding the pacemaker follow-up and, and uh, you'll be uh, very much uh, 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 disappointed to hear that in the, in the most of the hospital uh, in this country, apart from uh, maybe an ICVD or a few uh, Evercare hospital, there is no organized pacemaker follow-up clinic as well. So it is a, in a very uh, haphazard fashion that pacemaker patients, the ICD patients or the CRT patients are being followed up. And, and, and this is one of the reasons that the optimization of the device is... Uh, most of the patient, it cannot be made possible. Uh, I think Atar uh, by or Rafi have uh, tried their I'd best. I'd like to add something. Uh, we don't have yeah. the programmer in our hospital, so we have to depend on the company people. And whenever, uh, usually what I do, I ask the patient to remain connected with the company people, and uh, I do a uh, pacemaker follow-up on every Wednesday. In, at the OPD and ask my patients to call them when they can give time on that particular day. And uh, according to that, they uh, take my appointment and come. And also the company people come and uh, I interrogate uh, 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 with the assistance of the company people. And so thank you. The, the, the next case will show us even more on this. Let's yeah. see. Okay, okay thank you. Question. Thank you. Uh, this is a patient, a 63-year-old male with a dual chamber pacemaker implanted uh, about eight years back. And the patient uh, presented for follow-up. Uh, we can see uh, AV synchronous, AV sequential pacing, but in some cases, particularly some P waves are isolated and there is a complex which has generated some normal P waves. So uh, possibly uh, the, the ventricular lead function is uh, normal or optimum here. The atrial lead 
function is questionable. Can I have the question, comment of the experts, please? Most likely, uh, this type of uh, feature comes when the axial lead floats on the axial. It's not in contact with the axial wall. Yeah. Uh, in that case, sometimes it is sensing and um, uh, there is um, uh, sequential as well as synchronized pacing. But sometimes it, it misses the P waves to sense and there is no complex after. There is a gap followed by uh, a uh, especially in the uh, fourth, fifth, sixth bits, the, there is a, a sequential pacing. And again, after that, there is synchronized pacing. Probably sometimes the actual lead touches the actual wall and sometimes it doesn't. That must be the most likely possible. Uh, can I comment? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So if you look at, forget about the first V for the general audience. Second one, there is a P wave followed by a QRS complex, so atrial cell ventricular pacing. Third bit, atrial cell ventricular pacing. Fourth, atrial cell ventricular pacing. Fifth bit, there is a P wave. So there is no pacing spike or QRS. That means this P wave was not sensed. Yes. And because of that, it pays the atrium and pays the ventricle. Uh, look at the timing. It is a ventricular driven timing. I think the device is program 60 and the actual pacing spike coming exactly after 1000 millisecond, which is the rate of 60. And then there is a P wave, which is not sensed. Actual sensed, paced, ventricular paced. Again, another P wave not sensed. So what happened? I think this is the eight year old pacemaker. I don't believe the lead is floating around because it is eight year old. So what happened? The sensing can change. Let's say the P wave was two millivolt and the pacemaker was programmed at one millivolt sensing. And for some reason, fibrosis, the P wave now is one millivolt. So if it is one millivolt programmed at one millivolt sensing, you will sometimes sense, sometimes not. And the best thing is to integrate this device, measure the P wave in amplitude and program the actual sensing um, less than what the P wave is. So it will make that just sense a little bit more sensitive and that will probably solve the problem, provided everything else is fine, the lead dependence and everything is fine. I'll not, it's just a question of reprogramming this pacemaker. Thank you, Philip Boshi. Okay, let's proceed further. This is also a patient with a dual chamber uh, VDD pacing, uh, we, we can clearly see the P wave is sensed, followed by a ventricular uh, pacing spike. But uh, the expected uh, morphology of the paced ventricular beat is likely to be left-hand block pattern. But in here, we can see that the, the QRS morphology is a bit different. So what's your comment? Whether the ventricular lead, is it, uh, it is functioning properly or it has generated a, a something, a, a, a bit which is which we, we call, define as a pseudo fusion bit, uh, which is, inter, uh, and does it indicate any pacemaker malfunction? And uh, was this uh, program, uh, lead program to Unipol? The spikes are too large. No, any polar. But the QRS morphology is uh, not Very Very ideal, ideal, ideal QRS morphology for a paste rhythm is not visible here. Sir? If there is nobody commenting. So this is normally functioning pacemaker, actual cells, ventricular pacing, but it's a pseudo fuchsia. It's a conducted QRS complex. We are just wasting battery in this pacemaker. This pacemaker should be programmed with a longer AV delay so that it will allow conduction and when, if it is beyond certain level, then it will pace. So, and if, if this pacemaker has a dynamic AV delay on, that should be turned off because it is simple wastage of pacemaker battery. This patient 
does not need this pacing, but this is just still efficient. It's a good ECG. Rafik sir, uh, so can the patient uh, be symptomatic uh, because of this sort of uh, pseudofusion bit, or uh, it is, is like unlikely to produce any symptoms? This has no clinical implication at all. Okay. okay. Unless and neither what, unless yeah. if this is programmed unipolar, you can see muscle twitching in the clavicular region. Okay. Because if it is unipolar programming, um, the the electricity passes from the pacemaker can to the um, device and sometimes it can cause muscle twitching uh, in the pacemaker area. Otherwise, it should not cause any symptom at all. Yeah, so we should not uh, misinterpret this ECG as a pacemaker malfunction. It is the, no, no. the main, uh, uh, main uh, take home message uh, should be from this ECG that this sort of ECG uh, can be uh, normalized with a little bit of reprogramming of the AV delay, as Rafik Sar has mentioned. Rafik Bhai, I have, I have a comment because we see that chronically paced right ventricle has an implication. But I, I like this thing that we always let the native conduction allow and we don't need to consume the battery and give forced RV pacing. Here, we are basically seeing forced RV pacing. That may have you know, some reports about RV dysfunction and shortness of breath. But I like your comment that we always should allow the native conduction. So PR interval program longer. So see the, it conducts and we don't need to force space all the time. Yeah. Can right, I move ahead? Uh, this is another uh, 65 year old man with a dual chamber pacemaker, he had a blunt injury to the chest while he was driving, steering wheel injury. And after the steering wheel injury, uh, this ECG was taken. And uh, uh, can you please uh, make a comment about this? The ECG is uh, uh, showing the right bundle branch block pattern. Uh, and what may be the cause of this sort of, we, we expect a, a left bundle band block pattern and there is a two spikes are coming at a perfect timing but the ventricular capture is uh, not normal in all these ecgs a, a, a rhythm strip would have been much helpful yes <laughs> anybody want to comment on this uh, uh, the ventricular spikes fall on the fewer. And um, HCL spikes, sometimes it seems just before fewer, sometimes much earlier than fewer. So uh, to me, both um, capture failure in both the lips. I don't know what's maybe the cause. Okay. So uh, let me comment. So there is atrial pacing spike and the ventricular pacing spike, but um, Actual pacing spike, um, if you look at the problem is the rhythm still, but if you look at lead to, there is P wave before, after each actual pacing. And the AV delay probably is set at 120 millisecond. And so I think the um, Jamal's point is that why the QRS uh, pacing spike is on the P wave is because there is delay in the atrium, but it is not capturing in the ventricle. I'm not sure that this has, this has anything to do with the um, accident. accident. Yeah. Why? Because we don't know what happened before. If something happens during the accident, you will fracture the lead, which is unlikely. If you fracture the lead, then you will not see any pacing spike in the ventricle. So I think that is, unless there is blunt trauma to the chest, which caused um, increase in ventricular capture threshold. So it's basically ventricular pacing failure. Um, whether it's related to the accident or not um, is debatable. Okay, let's move on then. Otherwise? Yes. What is the follow-up on the patient, Khaled Masih? 
Actually, it, it, the... it, 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 it was found that the ventricular lead has been displaced following the blood trauma. Okay. Uh, micro, <laughs> micro, micro displacement. Karat Moshin, how yes. many ECC do you have? More? No, 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 I, I can finish. <laughs> I can yeah. finish. Asa, this should be the last ECG. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a patient uh, which uh, he had a VVI pacemaker and he was undergoing uh, elective surgery. And before elective surgery, the pacemaker uh, was reprogrammed. And this was the re reprogrammed ECG. So uh, our fellows will like to know that the rationality of the reprogramming of pacemaker before uh, elective surgery and what problems of interpretation it can cause. But Khaled Moshi, yeah. actually what is the ECG diagnosis? Five, one, two, three, four, five. Five yeah. beats are captured. Yeah. In six beats, seven beats, and there are spikes after the giver has come. So it is the. If one seems to be much a little narrower than the previous four beats, this may be fusion beat, and followed by yeah. normal normal QRS complex and uh, spikes after the QRS. Okay. On this, one, this is the two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, four beats. Four beats are well captured. Fifth beat. Six, seven, eight meters. So let me, let me, Atharvai, let me, let me ask you a basic question because we get this uh, consultative service in the hospital all the time or outpatient that patient needs uh, evaluation because patient has a pacemaker before surgery. Question is what surgery and what they're going to do? I don't know what surgery because this has important implications because do you need any program? if we know what surgery it is. For example, cataract surgery, no need. Yes. Uh, I'm giving you exam extremes. Yes, exactly. Um, can I make a comment? Yeah, yes, very, very. So yeah. this pace packet has been programmed asynchronous and it is continuously pacing. The first narrow QRS, there is a pacing spike just before the QRS. The other one probably in the QRS, the next one is after the QRS. Yes, sir. The, there are two reasons that you need to reprogram nature of the surgery and nature of the need for pacemaker. This patient, if you look at, he, this patient has normally conducted QRS complexes and having a surgery in the leg, there is no need to do anything. Even if this patient is having surgery uh, in the chest, what I will tell them, keep a magnet in the operating room. If you see any long pause from only reason that you can see a long pause will be use of cautery. So if we use judicious use of cautery, it doesn't create a problem. Only time that we re reprogram asynchronous is if there is surgery um, will be done in the chest and there is possibility of using um, cautery and the patient is pacemaker dependent. Because in that case, if you encounter a long pause, you will have problem. But we try not to reprogram them into asynchronous mode. We would rather tell the anesthesiologist to have a magnet because if they put a magnet over the device, it can become asynchronous. That's the much better way of doing it. And you look at the last keyword as pacing on the T wave. So these are not, not the thing that you want to have, want this patient to happen in the operating room. So Ravik, by let me translate that, this into into a general cardiology English language because yes. we do pacemaker for sensing and pacing purposes. If the patient is dependent on the pacemaker and then yes. quarterly inhibits the pacemaker, then there will be a systole. So we want to make sure that we force pace the patient with the VOO mode for the general participants so that we understand in better language that we force pace and then no quarterly is an issue. And that because if therefore, if it is a leg, the quarterly is not going to inhibit the pacemaker, so we are safe. Yeah. What uh, I also add some something that is, um, if possible, uh, to use a bipolar diathermy and a unipolar diathermy. 
as because unipolar diathermy has a long loop, bipolar diathermy has a short loop, and to avoid uh, any uh, diathermy use within six inches of the uh, pacemaker can or uh, the tip of the uh, uh, lid system, and if that's not possible, then post pacing is uh, applicable. Excellent point, and this is in the Heart Rhythm Society guidelines, 15 centimeter rule. But uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I just wanted to make sure that it is very difficult to convince the surgeon with that diathermy business. But it is in the Heart Rhythm Society. But excellent point. So uh, let me make a comment about the unipolar and bipolar cautery. Yeah. Bipolar cautery is not very easily available in the hospital. Most of the hospitals, yes. even, yeah. have, yes. even in America, you will have difficult time finding it. Forget about Bangladesh. So what you do is look at the placement of your indifferent electrode. Yes, if somebody has a pacemaker and you want patient is undergoing abdominal surgery, try to put the indifferent electrode as low as possible so that the circuit is far away. And with the circuit being far away, and then, um, uh, uh, and also, well, quarterly use, how is the surgeon going to look use the quarterly? If, the, the problem is surgeons have to look at the screen that look, there is inhibition, stop the quarterly, do intermittent cutting. So those are the kind of advice that you can give to a surgeon that instead of giving uh, 20 seconds of continuous quarterly use, make it into short burst um, of this, that helps. Thank you. Bhai, I think- Yes, Acha, yes. Thank you, Professor Khaled Moshin for your excellent presentation and introducing and inviting the excellent discussion about the pacemaker ECG. This was the least discussed part of our uh, ECG session. Nicely presented. Thank you very much, Khaled Mahashin. Our Thank next speaker is Professor Saudri Hafizul Hassan. He's waiting. Saudri Hafizul Hassan and his team. I think Dr. Christoph Shoshu and Dr. Omar will, will be with you. So, so actually, I'm doing, an, I'm doing an experiment and uh, two of our uh, first year fellows um, uh, volunteered, basically. <laughs> and I talked to Rafik Bhai because I think uh, as we are uh, starting this in institutional presentation, I think it's important that our uh, junior fellows, uh, they start uh, joining them and learn how to present and how to interact with the faculty and see how the faculty interact. I think this is very important. And for that reason, um, I invited uh, Chris Susu uh, from our program and also Omar Talawal. Chris Susu came to us from New Jersey. Um, his uh, Recommendation was from Dr. Mark Cohen, who was my mentor. So as you know that it carries a lot uh, when uh, somebody uh, requests and certifies uh, a physician for to take into your training program. In, in the US, this is huge. As Rofik Bai once sent me one fellow, he ultimately became an EP fellow um, and is doing very well. So Chris, um, he is going to, can you start sharing Chris? Uh, while I, so we don't waste time. Can you, can you please unmute Chris and then Chris can upload the theme actually, I'm going to stand back and then Rafik Bai will take over. This is actually uh, an arrhythmia issues, um, basically ventricular arrhythmias and we'll talk about the management and how we approach. So Chris. Sharing please. Yes, we are seeing it. Please, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, sorry about that. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview that Hassan can fill in. Uh, there's a patient we managed. So our patient, he has some uh, non-specific chest pain, fatigue, short of breath. He was bradycardic. Um, so we were trying to assess for chronotropic incompetence. Uh, we stressed him, um, you know, the stress report did mention some non-sustained VT on his stress. His echo, his EF was, uh, you know, practically uh, 45 to 50%. Um, the patient was giving a telly um, to go home with, and this is a telly strip. And I would love for the expert to comment on this.
So Chris, looks like you enlarged it. Yes. Okay. So you see there's so that that's it tell tell you and we enlarge it here so you can see more and uh and a comment from the experts regarding what's going on. So we don't see that very well, but on the top there's a lot of uh PVCs and then in this we read the lower panel as sustained monomorphic VT. He was actually in a uh, gym cardiac rehab type situation. And uh, uh, and we, we read it as uh, sustained monomorphic VT. He did not pass out, but felt a little uh, fatigue and uh, dizzy. And then and sat down and uh, ultimately terminated to normal rhythm without any intervention. So what to do next? Uh, any uh, any uh, comment? What do what what do you think? What's the underlying cause? So Could let you... me give you a background. Sure. Susu, can you uh, go any... to the next, uh, Chris? Hmm? So he has history of this uh, ah. non-sustained VT and also history of uh, recent shortness of breath, and he had a calf because of that, and uh, and this was the cat film. And after that, he went for cabbage. So I don't know, Chris, you can play it well, but basically this is looks like a right, uh, like a co-dominant system, CTO of the circumflex, and then LAD was read as significant, and then right coronary. Uh, was uh, intermediate lesion and not significant. So um, next time, Chris, you, you do it at one by one. Otherwise, it, it right. doesn't sink very well. So go to the next slide. So he got cabbage, but during the cabbage, which I found out interesting, that he had a free rima and then jumped to the OAM and then all three uh, high grade OAM and uh, uh, further OEMs were tackled, but the surgeon opted not to do the uh, LAD, which makes me wonder that why that happened, you know? So go to the next slide. So, okay, so, so after that, uh, this happened. The patient came to me, still fatigue and occasional uh, uh, dizziness, so we gave the telly and the telly showed now sustained VT. So now what to do? LV function actually normal, preserved now. And he doesn't have any symptoms. So in he had a decent uh, uh, Lexi scan, like a Regardinosan PET scan with ammonia based, and that shows normal perfusion. Normal perfusion, EF normal, and then sustained VT, and then a, a LAD that the surgeon did not think significant, and then circumflex territory revascularized, RCA is okay. That could have, you can ask that, why the CTO of the circ was not tried, why he went for the uh, cabbage, but it is what it is, uh, not perfect. So what do you do now? Did you do the other test like the MPI? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The uh, myocardial perfusion imaging was done by PET scan and it, we use uh, uh, ammonia or rubidium and we used ammonia in this case and then uh, PET scan was normal. What? And then we have this sustained VT and his Referring cardiologist uh, uh, was not happy that the Lima was not used. And I looked at the film. I was not convinced either that this was significant. But surgery is already done. And now we thought it is good. 
he is not that symptomatic perfusion is can normal but because of this occasional in palpitation and dizziness i gave the telly and i created the problem because we captured this sustained vt what to do next what were his electrolytes and what medicine he was getting? Okay, so he was on beta blocker, aspirin, and then uh, he was on uh, one of the ARB, we use Losartan, and then high dose statins. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what was the, was there any scarring in the myocardium documented by myocardial imaging like echocardiography or anything like that the, before So the, as I said, uh, you know, the, the, if you look at um, uh, many experts on the echo, they will say the thinning of the myocardial wall uh, is a good way of saying old MI. Um, but his LV function was preserved and I'm not very good in confirming that there was no thinning, but the LV wall thickness measured was normal. But thinning is a sign for a uh, scar, you know, in the echo. Some people do the uh, contrast echo. Uh, some use the myocardial uh, uh, contrast with the uh, myocardial blast echo, but we did not do myocardial echo. And one of the best way to know scar is gadolinium enhancement. He did not have gadolinium enhancement. So what is LV the LV the, the, the blood pressure good, heart rate good normally. So uh, any any thought? So uh, Rovik Bhai just texted me, he left. He had to leave. Any, uh, so general cardiology issues, but do we surrender to EP or we the plumbers need to look at things again? Now, if there is no, so, uh, sorry. So th this is what we did in this case that uh, we call back the patient and then uh, we did the cath again. So Chris, do you have the films? Uh, I don't films. have the film on a redo. Okay, no, I don't so, have the film on. So, so the graft, including the RIMA, free RIMA, all good and patent. So I actually interrogated the LID the, because I was not sure that the intermediate lesion, whether that is a playing a role, although this is sustained monomorphic. So IFR was done, not FFR. IFR was 0 0.96, 0 0.97. And then that so we did not intervene. The surgeon was really happy because surgeon was thinking that, you know, this, we, we may have missed the LAD and that's a big issue. Uh, so, so now what? Can we increase the beta blocker? So we increase the beta blocker. And then question is sustained B, VT, increased beta blocker. And then we send the patient for EP study because we don't know yet whether this is a scar related VT or there is a problem sometimes we see is the epicardial VT or not. But I'll give you the feedback uh, once we do the EP and come back. Chris, go to the next. We'll go for a rapid fire of common problems. So yeah, go so ahead. So this is the, the, next, the next question is a 68 year old male uh, with multiple medical problems, except for he didn't have any prior cardiac history. Um, the patient is on dialysis. Uh, he, uh, after dialysis on that day, he went home and I called into the family. He fell and became unresponsive and EMS were called immediately and they arrived at the scene. And this was his initial uh, strips here. Uh -huh. And this was doing it. This was doing a resuscitation. So in a comment from the experts. Do you have the blood gas or electrolyte? Uh, his blood gas, the initial blood gas was unremarkable, 7.34 PCO2 was in the 40s. And his oxygen saturation was good as well when he arrived in the emergency department. And he was intubated in the field? He was into beta in the field, yes.
Do you have a 12 lead EKG? Uh, we, that was after resuscitation. So okay. this was an initial okay. EKG. Um, he received shock, uh, he, ACLS were prolonged, but Ross opt in, he was brought to the hospital. This is an ECG when he arrived in the hospital. I see only QT prolongation. Okay, go to the next EKG, okay, good. So when he arrived, we also did a echocardiogram. Um, so we have the parastonal axis. Any there. EKG comment? Uh, go, go, go back to the EKG. QT prolongation. Go, go back to the EKG, uh, Chris. The strip? Yeah. yeah. No, the 12 lead EKG. Previous slide. Hey, this one. Yeah. Okay, good. Look at this, all the QTs are prolonged. But I tell you what is our problem, right? That post resuscitation, the emergency room always calls us that post BFI patient should go to the cath lab, cardiology take over, and uh, they are on our nerves. So, because BFI, are we missing something? Is it a left main multivessel disease that we are sitting on? A lot of pressure on us. So, as cardiologists, what do we do next? Afiz bhai. And Ele as uh, Professor Chaudhary says, yeah. Electrolytes. Chris, Afiz, electrolytes. Uh, including magnesium. Cardiogram. Yeah, the last echocardiogram, they showed there is a epico anterior and uh, uh, there is a scar uh, possibly in the vicinity of the apical region. Uh, was it present before? We have no previous echo. And, and the guy does not, and the guy actually has no name because he's. Uh, yeah, we, we are don't still, know the name yet. We don't know the name because we. Homeless. We the call it, uh, we call it uh, uh, some stat name. Epical, stat. epical yeah. first chamber <laughs> view. It looks like there is some epical uh, scarring at yeah. the distal, uh, yeah. So this is a management issue, right? So how you go from here? Next. I mean, what do we? So the, the, patient, the patient currently is still intubated, uh, very poor mental status. Um, so the problem is, is in the medic formation, whether the patient was having chest pain or is it due to electrolyte abnormality? That's the two pronged thing right. you have to think about. ESRD patient okay. from the uh, dialysis. So that's the problem. So he electrolytes were normal, potassium of 4.5, uh, magnesium of 1.9. Uh, his phosphorus was okay. Um, his hemoglobin was fine as well. So electrolytes were, were, were relatively unremarkable. Yeah. Uh, we don't know the story prior to him uh, becoming unresponsive because, you know, we haven't been able to talk to him. But the family said once he came back, he just fell and then became unresponsive. That's all we have as far as history. So, so the, the important thing is that um, we need to evaluate these patients before rushing for any procedures. You know, the assessment is, is he me mentally how we assess the uh, the neural status. The second thing is that the hemodynamics uh, and then the blood gas. Blood gas, pH 6.9 or less, it's very poor prognosis. You need to think about before you do any uh, heavy duty interventional therapies or supportive care. Um, and, and, and the other important thing is that if, if we have this issue of ST elevation, then we are more challenged. If there is no ST elevation, you are thinking that this is um, a prolonged re resuscitation and no obvious reason to go to the cath lab, then we try to buy time and then think about the neuro recovery. In this case, uh, this was a collective decision not to go for hypothermia protocol uh, because of the overall poor prognosis. And that we did with the, in conjunction with the um, ICU team. 
So I just wanted to sh share the challenges uh, that we face, you know, uh, with this kind of problem. And, actually, and then what, we what found out, yeah. So they were actually, what medication he used? Actually, magnesium? We gave, we, we gave magnesium, yeah. But if the patient, uh, we get in the ER got this bolus amio, but we did not continue. Patient luckily was not on heavy duty pressor agents, just uh, right. levofed, then off levofed, and then uh, and then we are buying time to see whether there is any neuro recovery or not, and then we'll decide about what to do next. It turns out that his toxic screen was also positive. Go next, mm -hmm. next. Cocaine and other things. Actually, this patient does not have uh, any uh, criteria to activate the catheter. Well, Am I correct? Uh, the, correct. So th this this is the problem. We call it that the the, yeah. the uh, emergency room can call many reason to yeah. activate the cat lab, yeah. but we need to. And then when we go there, we need to decide about the overall. So Don't we need to pay our attention to overall comorbidities neurostatus, electrolyte imbalance, yes. if and any, and, the, and, and then, then decide about and And few things important to pay attention to. And unless we get our act together, we may go into a mess, uh, even bigger problem, and also unnecessary uh, utilization of the resources because uh, some of the patients may be really already in bad prognosis. So we need to use the judicious use of resources. Talking about the STEMI activation, let's look at the next patient. Let's see, go. So the next patient is a 52 year old female uh, who collapsed at home. Um, her medical history, she had depression, anxiety, chronic pain, insomnia. These are her, uh, this is a list of her medications. So this was her initial raven in the field. So we didn't get uh, EMS, didn't scan the whole thing in, but her raven looked like this exact ribbon. So this is her initial ribbon when e uh, EMS arrived. She got shocked outside. Yeah. Yes, she got she got shocked next, one foot times. Yeah. Next EKG. So this was her ECG. Um, patient got shocked, uh, brought to the ED, initially intubated, um, and then uh, subsequently patient was successfully extubated, and um, this is her next EKG. But I think this is a quite a pain and uh, other uh, medication induced long QT syndrome. Yeah. And he, she had cross up. Yep. Mm. Another so drug what, is duloxetine also causes uh, uh, long QT. Long QT. Yeah. Long QT, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cyclo I'm not sure about that. Most of the psychotropic drugs yeah. cause long QT interval. What about so, the Yeah. So we thought that this is long QT, then patient got extubated herself, and then mentation was good. What do you do next? Uh, what about the electrolytes? And the, uh, is there any blood uh, uh, estimation of the uh, uh, suspected drugs? Any over or anything? Have you done the um, drug, of drug level of the med medication she was getting? Serum level of drugs. We, therapeutic yeah, we don't have the ability to test those drugs. Level. Therape therapeutic monitoring. Whether there was, uh, as she okay. was depressed, whether she attempted to take all medication at a time to commit suicide, that might be one possibility to take antidepressants a lot. What happens with the depressed patients? I see. I see. But happy guy, I'm always in case of arrhythmia. I'm interested in the electrolytes. Chris, can you give us? Yeah, so on, yeah, I can hear you. So on this, uh, her electrolyte was unremarkable potassium, phosphor, magnesium, everything was within the normal limits. Uh, we did not check the level or her drug that she's on. We don't have the ability that that's a sent out lab. So we didn't check uh, the levels in her blood. Her urine toxic screen was negative as well for any uh, illicit drug use. Um, and she, you know, when she self-estimated, she said she wasn't trying to commit suicide. She always took her drug as prescribed. That's what she said. So just drug induced. 
Hafiz bhai, probably out of uh, net. So how? Uh, Hafiz bhai, have you got back to us? No, he didn't. Doctor or something. Yeah, he's coming. So Christoph, how did you manage actually? So uh, after, you know, she came in with, you know, Tosa, she was shocked. Obviously, we took her to the cath lab to check her coronary. We think it was drug-induced, but we can't 100% say it's drug-induced without looking at her coronary. She has some risk factors. Um, but her coronaries were, as you can see, the angiogram, uh, they were unremarkable. Uh, no obstructive coronary artery disease uh, was seen on her coronary angiogram. Beautiful coronaries. But Christopher. Yeah. So then the question is, what do we do with such patient? Uh, have a talk with his psychiatrist and talk about the <laughs> choice. So we are we are thinking that this is a long QT related torsad. So we did not give any ICD, and uh, right. this will be a negotiated thing with the psychiatrist to modify the medications and avoid a long QT producing drug. For the participants, I would say, we may not know long QT, which drugs cause it. If you Google it, actually there is a website, long QT website. You can get the list of the drugs, what does cause. The drugs concentration is important to see, but it may not necessarily correlate with the presence of long QT and the drug concentration. So it, it may not be helpful, particularly if you know that the patient is already taking drug. Sometimes drug uh, assay helps if you are not sure that the patient was taking the drug. But if the patient drug is already in patient's list, then it is good enough. And one of the way to do that, and I'm sure that one day in Bangladesh, and it's already happening in Bangladesh, that pharmacy now has list of medication that the patients take. Meaning that if we call CVS pharmacy, then the pharmacy will know what the patient was taking because the patient was taking the medication from that pharmacy and it is in the patient's file. So you can see that. And I'm sure that we can develop that kind of pharmacy list in Bangladesh as well, that what the patients take, there is a list and it is very convenient way to find out drug interaction and, and advice from the pharmacy to the patient. Uh, I, I have a pharmacological background, so I'm very emotional about that kind of thing, drug interaction and all that. So with that, I think the, we are running out of time. Yeah. Omar actually prepped the case. So if, if you can kindly give us two minutes, so Omar can show the last case, uh, because I told these guys to participate. And I, I really appreciate all of you to have the patience to allow uh, the fellows to present the case. We really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. So Omar, are you okay to? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Um, okay, let me share the screen. Just that uh, to let uh, Omar and Chris know, in Bangladesh, this is already 11 o'clock in the night. So you realize that these guys are all... <laughs> And not yet. There's 20 minutes to 11. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll be quick. Uh, are you? Can you guys see my screen? <clears throat> yes, we can see. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I will uh, start the case. Uh, she's a 68 years old female patient um, with past medical history of liver cirrhosis. She presented to the to the ER status post cardiac arrest. EMS picked her up from uh, from her resident. Uh, she, they found that she was uh, vomiting in blood, lost her pulses, and she received CPR and intubated en route. Um, on arrival to the ER, she was hypotensive and tachycardic. These are the initial vitals. And um, as we said, um, we don't have much information at that point. And uh, cardiology were consulted for this EKG. So this is, uh, this is very important that we ask what was the rhythm because uh, the, I always ask this question that is the first rhythm, noticeable rhythm is V-fib or pulseless electrical activity or asystole because V-fib is, is something that we are involved heavily. 
If it is a PA arrest, patient with post MI or primary cardiac coming with PA, the differential goes other way, like pericardial effusion, tamponade, um, yeah. or severe hypoxia P on that route rather than cardiac. We did not have any exact rhythm. And sometimes late in the game after the AP, BFib appears, that does not count heavily as without any intervention, first rhythm is BFib. Uh, so we don't know in this case what happened, but this is the EKG. Um, so any comment? You know, there is a very funny way of looking at EKG. When we look at this EKG, we look at tachycardia and significant ST changes, lead AVR, ST elevation, and there is deep ST depression. But the EP guys will say, they will spend more time, and Ravik Bhai is not here, I'm pulling their legs. They will <laughs> spend they will spend half an hour to find out this is a fee or what. But first, ideally... The, <laughs> first, the rhythm is irregularly irregular. Yeah. <laughs> there is no discernible P wave. Yeah. And uh, there is um, gross SP depression in uh, lead V3. As well as uh, V4, V5, V6. And uh, um, that may be tracking induced also. And uh, if... That's so what the, I, the, I say. Because of this AVR, ST elevation, deep ST depression, they actually, this case, they actually activated the cath lab for ST elevation MI. And uh, now we'll have to deal with this. Uh, so our problem is that when they call us, it is the emergency room physician and only cardiology, no ICU. And problem is that the ER wants this patient out of the emergency room because then it is not their headache. It is our he, headache. He's shouldering, he's shouldering. <laughs> <laughs> and and once you take it, you cannot get this patient back to ER. So your cath lab will be stuck. And you, if it is cardiac, it is yours. If it is not cardiac, at that point, it is very difficult to give this present to someone else. So this is a big problem. So we need to decide. That's why we train ourselves that we buy time in the ER before we buy in this asset, you know? <laughs> I, I take it this Actually, way. Half, half his way. Yeah. This kind of uh, ECG often we get with the CKD patient having hemodialysis. Often they yeah. present to the ER with uh, shortness of breath with atrial fibrillation and they yeah. come to the cat, uh, CCU. Yeah. Uh, and after that, the nephrologist do not want to take it over. They, they keep it there, their advanced dialysis, and I have to follow up the patient in CCU. They don't want to take over. They don't want to shift the patient yes. to the ICU even. Yeah. They say, no, he has um, uh, atrial fibrillation, so it's a cardiac patient. Yes, you are absolutely right. So it's a, it's a big problem. So I think we need to work in together as a team. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, my view is if it is predominantly cardiac, I take it. If it is yes. predominantly ICU, then you take it. But question is, what do we do in this kind of patient? Uh, so I, also, I, I, I usually buy time in the ER, get more data because patient is already you know, intubated uh, and then they're thinking about what to do. Um, so uh, it turns out to be, uh, Omar, you have the further data? Yeah, that, so um, we tried to buy time. So we repeated the EKG. We thought this could be because of uh, uh, CPR and uh, uh, they given uh, epi. So the repeated EKG was also similar yes so uh the stat lab the initial stat labs we had were uh, that was the hemoglobin 5.3 yeah. uh, the patient was severely acidotic as well um there was no major electrolyte abnormality some hypokalemia uh however uh, acidosis and low hemoglobin was the uh the the, the two significant findings um so um uh, the so we the patient with uh, like intubation with suction found out to have a lot of coffee ground emesis. They start massive uh, um, uh, transfusion protocol, and um, uh, luckily at this point, after starting, the, the, she yeah. initially used pressors, but with the blood uh, she, like blood pressure recovered and GI were on board for this patient uh, okay. for urgent. Okay. So, so, so there is another problem now, right? 
It right. was actually good for the patient that there was a revealed bleeding. If it is a concealed bleeding, it's a bigger problem yeah. because the GI is always the problem. <coughs> and then you do go act test and then you suspect, you call the GI. When you call the GI, you have another problem. The problem is GI says, this is cardiac. We're not, you need, we need clearance. And this concept in the hospital that cardiology is a clearing forwarding agent, I don't buy that. We say we actually minimize the risk or we optimize the patient. We said, this is you know extreme example is if somebody is having a STEMI and a femoral artery laceration, who, do, who takes care of the patient first? I give that example always because it is a, it is a, a coordinated work. So the GI will say, you know, I'm not going to go in because the patient is cardiac MI. And actually it is not the GI, it's the anesthesia who gives this sedation to the patient for the scope, they, they got worried. What do you do the, at that point? How to assure them that, hey, we are holding your hands, you go first, fix the bleeding source first. Yeah. I'm sure you have the same problem. Yes. yes. And anesthetist pushed towards again, uh, towards the cardiologist in for the to so, give anesthesia. So, so yeah, I am absolutely very friendly with them. And I said, look, I am doing the next thing, which is an echocardiogram and always echo is helpful. And look at this echo, what we found. And we told them that you go first, but we did the echo bedside. Omar, you have the echo film? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. This is the uh, the echo. This is the personal long axis. Any comment from the expert? How old? Am I it's, look, seems uh, there is no regional um, wall motion abnormality and contracts very well, uh, almost obliterating the lumen. So How it's uh, the hyperdynamic. Patient. Jamil, by excellent observation, actually this was hyperdynamic. Yeah. with LV outflow tract functional obstruction. Yeah. And the patient has previous history of hypertension. And this is not familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is hypertensive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the LV functional obstruction. In the case of hypotension, it helps a lot. It gives fluid resuscitation, fluid, fluid, blood transfusion. And if we need to give any vasopressor, it is primarily not levofed, it is vasopressin or phenylfrin, basically alpha blocker, helpful, but the patient got the GI endoscopy. Sorry, Omar, I'm rushing because it is already no, getting no. late. So uh, they got the GI endoscopy and what they found? They found there was a ga deep gastric ulcer. They had to cauterize, and, cauterize initially and clip. And uh, yeah, that was the finding. And, and of course the troponin will come positive they still the team will all be on your nerves. Will you do angiogram or not? I told them <laughs> chill, LV function normal, little troponin, anemia type two MI. You need to stand you know, back a little bit and then we can do a evaluation later on. There is no rush. So yeah. patient Abhi survived and did well. Actually any hollow viscous uh, trauma causes raised tropi from the yeah. smooth muscle. So uh, any uh, assault to the gut, stomach, might raise that uh, troponin to the uh, mild to moderate, modest level. And that does not mean that the patient has any stamina. Okay, so um, I'm actually, I, I will show a couple of cases next time with this concept of troponin. Yes. And, and type one versus type two MI and interaction. But um, that's what we have for today. Uh, unless you have any questions, Omar, you have anything to say? No, no, I'm just. I have the uh, just, just the, the the gradient uh, through the LVOT and okay. the M mode just to look at the uh, okay. LVOT. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for nice cases. Just concentric remodeling. Uh, happy Thank you, everyone. These are very practical cases that we can find anywhere in the world. Yes, yes exactly. So these are very nice cases. And Omar and Chris, very much thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you for yes, having us. I learned a lot today. Papa?
Christoph. Christoph, no, no ER. Just okay. Christoph. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. It's just a little bit of French uh, uh, influence, Christophe. It is French, yes. Uh, I'm right. <laughs> All right. Uh, we yeah. should remember something. It's the hemoglobin that is the key to carrying oxygen. Because if you are reducing the partial pressure of oxygen by half in the breathing air, still your blood will contain enough oxygen to sustain you. But if you reduce your hemoglobin by half, your oxygen level will be around one third to one fourth of what it has been before. So any SP elevation in a very anemic patient, we should try to resuscitate, particularly if the patient do not have a discernible uh, uh, history that suggests that this is an ischemic origin. Because that's secondary ischemia. We have to correct the anemia. You know, when we talk about the Krebs cycle, the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, it makes us panic. It takes us to the medical school again. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but one important thing that in the oxygen dissociation curve, hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, but mm -hmm. think about that along with hypotension significant. That screws up the whole thing about hypoxia related myocardial injury. Yes. You know, because with the oxy hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, as we read in the medical school, it is always in the presence of normal hemodynamics. Nobody yeah. talks about oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve in the presence of hypotension. Remember, this patient's blood pressure was 65. So yeah. it's kind of interesting. We need to have some model that what happens with this kind of thing when there is a change in hemodynamics, kind of fascinating. Again, uh, uh, this, this hypotension also lead to the, some damage to the skeletal muscles also from where this troponin is also released. Yeah, but the high sensitive troponin, the skeletal origin yeah. is almost yeah. not heard of, uh, yeah. but cardiac troponin is okay. You know, we know that it can be injury, it can be hypoxia related, it can be type two, it can be non-type two and is still injury pattern, but troponin means nothing at this point. Yes, yes. So, Atar bhai, would you wrap up? Yeah. Yes, actually, uh, excellent cases, beautiful presentation and nice discussion and congratulations to our first speaker, Dr. Khaled Mohsin, and finally, Dr. Choudhury Hafiz Hassan and his team. Particularly, big congratulations to Dr. Omar and the Christoph Sosu. Dr. Omar and Sosu, actually, we enjoyed your presentation and we want to have you in the every session in the Saturday. This time, every time in Bangladesh. Big congratulations. Thank you very and much. Finally, Thank you for yes. having us. We'll try to be there. Okay, okay. Okay, Christoph Sosu will come. We enjoyed your lecture. And this is the time. Actually, in next Saturday, our presentation will be from Dr. Poppy Bala. Dr. Poppy Bala, and the second time, in the second part of the session, Dr. Rupi Gamil, sir. So, Dr. Ashir Jaman Tushar, you will conclude the session just after a few talks from the Dr. Wadu Chaudhary. Chaudhary, few comments and then Ashir Jaman Tushar. Uh, no, no comments. Actually, I enjoyed it. I have been late today. I was in a traffic jam. Uh, I have missed only a, a few, uh, around 10 minutes of Khalid Bhai's lecture. But, Today, he focused on pacemaker-related problems. He showed some practical problems. Khalid Bhai, many, many thanks to you because you have shown some practical problems that we face and how to uh, deal with those cases. That will be very much helpful for our fellows and specialists, both, both groups. The second, uh, Hafiz Bhai, as usual, uh, with humor and wit and uh, beautiful case selection, his team has shown us beautiful cases uh, that has much learning uh, points, particularly how to deal with a complex situation where nothing is in black and white, everything is in gray. And you have to swim through the uh, black water and survive and have a smile. So these lectures, these presentations, these cases always enlighten us and hopefully will be useful in our daily practice, clinical practice.
Thank you, everybody. And Beximco, your team, Ribhu, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, dear physicians, for attending this session. And we wish your uh, continuous presence will enlighten us, will uh, give, uh, the <clears throat> give us more uh, chance to help the students and the fellows to uh, know about ECG in clinical scenarios and how to deal with it. And today, the two sessions basically deals with clinical scenarios and what physicians need to do at that moment. Thank you, Professor Khaled Mohsen, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Chaudhary Hafiz Alsan, sir, and Christoph Sosu, and Dr. Omar. Thank you, Vexen Group Pharmaceuticals, for their continuous support. And uh, good evening to all the participants and all the uh, faculties. Thank you, and good night. Okay, good night. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.